Showtime. And we're live. Showtime. Showtime. Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, it's been a while, I've been on vacation, so skipped a couple of episodes of this show. And we're we're moving to back into Paso again. Um, not a young, new, up and coming winemaker this time. We're gonna dig into I'm not the, that old. <laughs> we're gonna dig into a bit of an, ancient history. Yeah. And you may have seen the Facebook ad, and I don't think that was really Joe Barton because whoever that guy was, he was wearing a tie. Yeah, exactly. That was a one-off. That was a one-off. You know, actually, the most like that was like uh, yeah. the kids' photos, like Christmas card right. photos. Christmas yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it works. It's a dual promotion. Yeah. Really well. So Joe been in the region his dad started, and that's kind of where I want to go today a little bit. We're going to taste some great wines and uh, a bonus at the end of the show, but. Joe's dad came in an earlier time of Paso, and one of the most frequent questions that I get asked in this business by people is, you know, is, uh, have been asked over the last, whatever it is, 30 years, is Paso going to turn into Napa? Is it going to explode? And I've always said, yeah, of course it will eventually. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. better soils, better climate, better wines than anywhere else, so why wouldn't it? But to go back to the origins, the er not the earliest guys, but the wave that was just passed when I arrived, I think is really interesting and important. And that's where where Joe's family came in, not wealthy people moving into the area to to lose their fortune, but people coming because they love the area and wanted to do something cool and fun. So that's kind of what, where I wanted to go. Really welcome, by the way. Yeah, no, Cheers. thanks, man. Cheers. I that's 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 cool. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're rolling with that because lately I've been I've been spending a whole lot of time just having those conversations, especially when the, with my girls somewhat curious now, 13, 16, they just, sure. you know, the storytelling is a lot more fun. Well, I was trying to explain to someone today that when I first ran into you, you'd sort of just been dragged out of college because of what happened with your dad, and you were not that excited about the whole situation, particularly when you were into it, but not like you are now, I would say. So yeah. just to kind of go through that, you know, your dad was a fireman, right, from Baco. No, no, he was. He wasn't fireman. He wasn't. He, well, the funny thing, well, I think I the fireman, him when he's, he was a fireman. That's all. Awesome. Thirty years. Well, <laughs> the best thing about it is that when that, that original place we were at when we started was um, Barron, that place over on the east side, which was uh, on Penn and Springs Road. I had forgotten that. Uh, yeah, so we were out there, and it's now Penn and Springs uh, Winery. But at first, that was Barron. I remember was Barron. Tom, Tom Barron. He was a fireman. So he was yeah. a fireman. He was a fireman. He was a city councilman. Okay, and um, we, we took um, we took over that bond, and that was really our, our entry. You know, we needed an entry. We needed a place to. And you were just, a kid. Uh, yeah, I was a Cal Poly. You know, so I was driving up from Cal Poly, running the tasting room. You know, that's out on Union Road, and and you think about it now. I mean, you know, if I saw like two three people in a day running the tasting room dry, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I took a few bottles home <laughs> afterwards at the end of the day. Actually, I, I can still remember being up there. It was so funny because you know. I mean that's when I mean that's when wine was like twelve bucks. You know, we were right. I mean that, I mean not that that was not that that was like you know we were selling cheap wine. but that was the wine cost back then. Right. You know I mean like yeah. I remember when guys start talking about you know selling well, wine which is quite expensive. <laughs> yeah, when people are saying like, hey, I'm gonna put thirty five dollars on the price tag. Like, Whoa, slow down, yeah. man. Now who you're up down us. Tasting fees didn't exist. Yeah, everything was free. And I remember being out there one time and I remember, so I'm give like, us a reference. I'm, not that we want to know how old you are, but well, it was like 90, 94, 95. 94, 95. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was already in, involved. Yeah. At that point, with, I was with Munch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're at Adelaide, and, and you know, we were, you know, we were buying a little bit of juice, uh, making a little bit of juice, but making it at other places. Um, I know the old, you know, Paul out at the old school Mission View, you mm -hmm. know, we made some out there, and then, you know, Danny, cool. Danny was, uh, the dough was out there, right? Robert at one point was, I remember, there was kind of a change. That was before he went to Norman. And then Chris Land. Chris Land, yeah. He used to buy grapes from Mission View for LA. Mm -hmm. Raspberry bombs. For my ideas. Yeah, we like, used to buy his infant out there. Then we would buy, well, then that's how I got to know Robert, because we would buy mm -hmm. some stuff from the heart, and then buy a little bit from um, Danny and Gary, when Danny was working at Everly. And then, of course, my dad was doing work for, for Justin Baldwin, helping him build some stuff out there. So oh, he did? I didn't know. See, I don't know any of what your dad did. I saw his farm when he came here and no, started he, built, he built that first 
winery building that he oh, built he up there. Yeah. No idea. And that was kind of my dad's like, you know, he was literally, I mean, he had to sell himself hard to Baldwin. Like Justin was like, nah, nah, nah I'm not, mm, no, he's feeling it. Not biting, not biting. <laughs> my dad's like, no, 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 here's the deal though. You know, my dad was a developer at one point. So, I mean, he, he had a, he had a gift for business and he's like, here, I'm going to, we're going to trade, you know I mean? And it's going to be a fair trade. Like I'm going to build this stuff out and, um, you know, you, you can trade the juice and you can you know, you trade me at, you know, the price you want it to be. And that was how we got our foot into this, you know, uh, stuff from, from Justin's vineyard, but also Conway and Carmody mm-hmm. midnight next door. My dad did some more figure at Conway. So he was just out just, you know, trading and just trying to get his hand in some whatever juice he could. And, um, you know, when after his, you know, right when he when he passed and had his accident, a lot of those people, and I, and I give a lot of, a, you know, a few uh, of, of them credit for, they saw it, they knew my mom and I were, you know, what? We're up to here and we don't know what to do. And a lot of them were super fair with just like, hey, you know. Dad did what? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, like we're looking at all these bills, like holy shit, how are we gonna pay for all this, you know? And we, and we could, but we just didn't know. And then and a lot of those guys who were who were selling us stuff and, and my dad at Barter, they, they gave us some really, really, you know, awesome uh, terms. You know? and, cool. and that really helped us get by that first year. And then after that, it was really, you know, it, you know that was that was the start point. And like you said, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was like, I don't care for Cal Poly. We thought, well, were you studying? I was fruit science. Okay. Well, so I was chasing the wine bug with my dad, um, but just literally had... I just got done working with Kendall Jackson, so I was doing like grower stuff, and I thought I was going to get on the farming side, truthfully. And I do actually, to the states, I actually prefer the, the farming over the winemaking, not because I don't like winemaking, just I just, and I'm growing so a little bit more interesting, you know, the soil, the mm-hmm. geology, and the history, and all that. But yeah, it was uh, certainly uh, such a different world. I drive around now, and I just kind of now I feel like I've been here around here so long. You see places, you're like. Stuff that didn't used to be here, you know. I mean, you, oh, you just kind of you see buildings, you see these all these things where this was a cool. Not it was it's still a cool town, but it was just a small town. We different town, such a different town. I was literally today driving down out from Talbot's Creek with my son Austin, who works out there with me now. <clears throat> and there's another one orchard that's the trees are on the ground and it's all getting dissed, and I don't think there's much question what it's going to be. Yeah. And he kind of made the comment. My kid made the comment. He's like, wow, you know, when when does it stop? It never will. And I was like, you know, and now I feel like the old timer guy. Like something. Yeah, I remember when we used to drive you to school. That was a pistachio orchard. That was an almond orchard. None of this yeah. was here. I told him. I started on working on that road in '92 mm-hmm. with Munch. January second, 1992. I started working on that later road. So there was no vineyards down that road no. at that point. Nothing. I mean, you, I don't think there was one. That you, no, there wasn't one. Brad and I drove out um, a couple days ago, and uh, <clears throat> we went to go look at. Uh, what did we go look at? I think we went to. Um, I can't remember now. Looking, but we ended up going just past you um, to look at that new Ramage deal uh, with my buddy Will John. Um, and I was driving, and I was telling him, like, man, I used to drive out here because I would go Willow Creek mm-hmm. and then pop out and, and pop out at Vineyard, and that was my that was my path to travel. I'm like, that's when me and my dad used to go back and forth when he was building. That's still my path of travel. Yeah, when, we used, when he used to, he was building stuff for Justin, like I'd go out and help him out there, you know, build stuff for Deborah, and, mm-hmm. and, and you know, we were building a horse barn for a long time. And I remember we would cruise back and, you know, have some, have some cold ones and some yeah. Cheetos and, and, and drive back, but there was nothing out there. I mean, all these vineyards, like I see, I'm like, that was there. It was before Tabas. I mean, they may have. I don't know when they purchased the property, but there certainly wasn't. 89. Yeah, so they, they owned the property, but there's nothing there. Yes. Halter was still McGivery Ranch, yeah. and then you know all of those spots were like none of them were developed. You couldn't. You, well, you would have seen on that drive, right from what is now Gray Wolf along Willow Creek, you mm-hmm. would have seen what is now the old oak that I buy most of my fruit from. Which that was, was Leona's. which is Leona's. and then you would have seen Uber off. Yep, James Berry was James Berry was just kind of just getting in there, just getting started. Kane. The, the Cain, yeah, up on that, that hill, hill, that weird little Pino Hill, yeah, yeah, that mm-hmm. would have been there. That and that's, that's it. Diamond Gem, until you got to Norman, until you got to Norman, yeah, and there was, and then, and then there was nothing from then, right? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> until literally for to me, until I got out to Justin, 
Yeah, well, that's, that's what it was. Yeah. So anyway, crazy, crazy development. I know it's just so it's so cool to for if you know people don't really you know once they get out there now they think like you know this is what they see now is what it is. I know this this is not what it is. It is. It is. It is, it is you know, now. It is what it is, and it's every hill and it keeps on going. And it, it's cool because it's our business. I mean, I kind of like go, wow, you know, it's not that long of a period of time. No, I mean it's 25, 30 years max, and it's. It's pushed so much, changed so much. And we're thinking about that today is that I was having my conversation with us and said, well, there's a moratorium on planting on the east side of town now, so maybe that's also impacting us. To- and well, everybody's pushing on. But I think me and you know that the terroir is definitely different and, and, and to me more interesting over here because of the because of the stone. Yeah, no, totally, totally. I, yeah. I get that, but no one wanted like when Bob Haas went to talk to Gary Everly about buying that property for Tarbles Creek. He told him, you don't want to do that. It's, you're going to run out of water and you freeze every year. And we did freeze. <laughs> totally. Almost every year. We haven't frozen since 2011 because things are changing. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, it's super interesting. But so the progression for you, you were working with your dad. Your dad passed away. What year was that? 98. 98. It's my first vintage, which you Lovely. remember 98. One of them yeah. really great that was, my, that was my first vintage at Tobles, too. And it's like, I look back when we started harvesting on October 6th. I was, my first pick was uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Daryl John, who was helping me out. Um, he had some Sauvignon Blanc out of Shannon. And I got Shannon Sauvignon Blanc October 3rd. Right. I mean, if that happened to me now, I would be beside myself. I just didn't know enough to know. I, I thought I was just making the right decision. <laughs> you know, I was waiting. But now, if I was in the late September and hadn't picked VMP, yet, I'd be like, well, dude, I had one of my last, this is, this is super fun. I won't name it like anybody, but I had a guy show up. He's like, hey, it's literally like two days before Thanksgiving. It's all, hey, I've got this cat from Super good. Just the pet ready. <laughs> so I was ready to go. And I roll out there, I'm all, and I drive out to it, I'm all, where it is. I'm like, well, it can't be that one. That brander's all brown. <laughs> you know, and he's like, and I think and that's not the video. Well, yes, that was, that was the video. Yeah, and I get this cab front that was 21 bricks. Oh, God, that was an awful image. And the wines are, for Thomas anyway, I've opened them since. I didn't think they, they'd hold up there. They turned out pretty well, it's, despite what went down. Well, and I mean, the decision to wait till October 6 was the right decision. Totally. I'm just not sure I have the fortitude to wait that long now. Well, the dichotomy of those two vintages back to back, 97, that was just like big and warm and they, ripe. I was in France, but they started picking 97 on August 16th. Yeah. So there's well, a swing. It was a little, actually, 97 was kind of reminded me of this year a little bit because it rained a lot in 96, and mm-hmm. then 97 came in, it, it rained a lot up to January, and then stopped. And then it just okay. didn't rain for the rest of this of vintage. And it was a good crop. And the 97 was like a super crop. Everybody was like, man, the quality was great. Dude, growers were getting big, big crop loads. It was just the mother load. And then 98 was the backside of it. Like it rained and it rained and it rained. Yeah. And it was late. And, and that's then- why I came back and I arrived back on the property at Talbot's Creek in July of 98. And just got there and was going, what's, what, wait a minute, what's going on? We should be starting to think about harvest. And it's nowhere even growing like, like a so. weed. <laughs> <laughs> is this March right now? I don't even know. I mean, I was that was when I was literally still fermenting underneath the oak tree behind the dash right. room. You know, so I remember my mom one time, like we were, I mean, I was still fermenting underneath that tree in late November. You know, it's starting to rain. It's starting to rain. I'm covering up with tarps. You know, my mom was yelling at me, like, the tarps fell off, the rain's getting in. You know, and like, holy oh, Jesus. That actually happens in my 98 low with your own cab was up at the gold ones up at the old York Ranch facility, and he had tarps uh, covering all the open tops to the right side, mm-hmm. and the tarps kind of turned into a pool drain and <laughs> drained into my cab for my <laughs> Sorry, Neil, but uh, your yield got better. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only vintage of Love and Journal I haven't made until last year. The cab. That the, uh, the car- what was that? Uh, Carter? Carver. 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 That's oh, right. Uh, and we're still making it and when we can get it. Yeah, to stay with that vintage we did not. It's Marcy looking for wine. Okay. Well, you want the you want the brandy? Oh, come on, get on that brandy. Make it smarter. So, <laughs> well, we're drinking in those days. You were cool. making 
Kevin A's infidel or Jordan A pretty much, right? You know, I was making sure. Yeah, I was making um, to me. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was making um, Chardonnay. We were making from um, uh, Justin and uh, Carmen Knight. I remember yeah. that. that oh no, sorry. And then we kept making Chardonnay, and we were getting it from um, Carmen Knight and Cougar Ridge. And Cougar was like just past Vineyard Drive. Vineyard Drive. There was mm -hmm. like there was that little pocket Vineyard Branch way. There was Casa Grande, Cougar Ridge. Yeah. So we were getting cab Merlot. Remember how big Merlot was yeah. in the late nineties? I mean, Hulk was crushing it. I made Merlot Reserve <laughs> so important part of my program. Yeah. <laughs> Still going? <laughs> I'm actually making Merlot again. Yeah, good. Yeah. Glad you are. I like Merlot. I do too. You just got a bit carried away. Didn't you? The whole scene. Yeah, no. I was can making Radicky Ranch. Uh huh. I remember that. All good stuff. Oh, she's going right. Oh yeah, she's like, I'm skipping that. <laughs> but now, now things have changed. Now we're into all kinds of stuff. I mean, we're tasting the 2020 Calvis Creek Pickle Gronk. Of course, all the state grown involved. Mm -hmm. I there was a period of time when I made Pickle Gronk for Talbot's Creek, and then Don Rose at Glen Rose had planted just a few vines around his fence line. Mm -hmm. It's more like a decoration than they are, yep. because no one knew what it was. Yeah. And he came to me and nobody would buy it. And so I bought it. So at a certain moment in time, I was making all of the Pinot Noir and Paso Robles. Pick what we For two different, yeah, yeah. sorry, pick what For two different, for two different wineries. The whole, the whole production of Paso is okay. going through me. Well, and I've gotten that. Through the sellers of Talos. Now, Ryan Pease took that, when I dropped that vineyard, he took it. Yeah, and I yeah. started splitting in with him for a couple of years, yeah. and then now I'm it's great pick. Yeah, now I'm working with you on Old Oak, and um, God, I and I'm, I'm looking to plant pig bull at my new venture over not far from the um, your guys' Pinot uh, from Full Circle, right? Ridge Road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a fantastic. It will be a great bull. site, and it's you know pig bull. I would say pig bull Grenache Blanc were two of the grapes that. Uh, surprised everybody involved in Talos Creek, the French included, and they didn't come to Paso Robles thinking that they were going to make white wine. They they were going to make a white wine, but they didn't think it, it was, was going to be a part of it. They didn't think it would be a big thing, just like yeah. they big thing for their Chateau Neuf property. But the big pool showed up, and I remember the first year, I can't remember what year it was, but it was like 2003 or something, 2004 maybe. And I kind of it was like a small dog with plant. I kind of forgot about it. Mm -hmm. Just got into harvest. Like, oh no, the pit bull. We should. We need to sell the pit bull. Yeah, where is it? <laughs> it was like late in the season, so I thought I'd missed it. And we went and sampled it, and it was like these perfect numbers. Yeah, like better than anything else we picked. And we made it that first year. Holy cow, this is incredible! And then quickly, it replaced the Viognier in the spring mm -hmm. because. Just made sense. Blind tastings, we tasted with Viognier with Pickle, and everybody, including Francois Perrin, preferred the Pickle, and it's a chasse of variety of Viognier, isn't it? So it just made sense. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's just grown in popularity ever since. I mean, I still make a bunch for Lone Joan that you share some of that vineyard, the old oak vineyard, the yeah. farm head train. Pease is doing a good job with the big pool up on the Glen Rose these mm -hmm. days. More and more people making it. And we've got planting it. And, and it's so site specific, too. I mean, I don't think it's, it, it can't be everywhere in Paso. No, um, but on the limestone in the right spot, it does really well. I mean, it can live with the heat because it holds its acidity so well. Yeah, and I think on some of the spots, too, I mean, like, you know, on my new place, I don't I don't have, you know, quite as a, a significant underlayment of lime, but I have a nice, you know, I think, I think, on the clay a little bit, it'll, it'll, it'll take it and get a little bit more rounder and not be as, you know, you know, sometimes on the top, top, top stuff, it, it gets a little bit more zingy. Ridge Road will be a little different because it's going to sandstone you over there, right? I and mean, then more than lime. The lime. It's going to be interesting down there for sure. It's works great for our Pinot over there, which we were told that. Yeah, I don't think it's all that dissimilar to old oak just because you've got, you've got the underlying stone, but you know, that rock is different. It's, at least the stuff we pull up involves. It's yeah, like, it's heavy, it's dense, sandy. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's good, but it's very different from what I deal with. Yeah, so well, it'll be it'll be yeah, curious least, to see. I mean, I think people, in, if we had me in sand, would be kind of interesting. I think it would be an interesting line. Yeah. Anyway, limestone it, it does incredibly well. It does handles the heat very well, as does the Grenache Blanc. So this is the twenties, brand new one, and we're 
I'm rolling neutral wood with the stainless steel. And then I do the Lemon Joe stuff is 100% stainless these days. Now, on um, the Tavos, do you guys um, go all secondary mallow? Or, or yeah. 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 I mean, it's always everything, of course, is native, native yeast, and native mallows in it. I think almost every year it's gone through. If it were a stick, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's very few things we we stop now on. Sometimes the uh, Vermentina is one we do just if it, it starts a little fleshy. We just taste it and it's like it's perfect right now. It's yeah. perfect. Then we do that. But Pitbull just has good enough acidity to, to run with it for me. I mean, it's got a richness, it's got a texture, but that acidity keeps it going. I mean, it, it's what it's known for. But I think I have little experience with the ones from France, but the ones I've tasted from from West Paso are better than anything I've tasted. I mean, it's usually people with Penne, it's super lean, yeah, simple, super bright. doesn't have complexity, doesn't yeah. have that mouthfeel texture that we get here. So, I was so, kind of in the middle of the old oak. We, we ended up stopping it. Um, I don't think it was purposely. I mean, it was purposely, but we're like, well, we just liked where it was at, kind of like how you guys said with the yeah. We just liked where it was at. It was one of those that was a really nice firm, good native firm, and all of our other firms were were just taking time. But that one just it just kind of this thing, and it was really a clean firm. And then as we're we're sitting at it, I mean, it's like one of those it was one of those firms where you're like, okay, I can assess this right now. Yeah, you know, it's ready. I, I I can I can let it go. I can let a lot go, but it's pretty much done its thing. And we were like, let's, let's hit it early and then and get it in the bottle. It works. Yeah. Cool. yeah. You know, Grenache Blanc was sticks. Forever. It takes forever. Yeah. Sticks and like we just, our, our Lama Drone just got done for a minute. Yeah. But, and we bought it like a week later. It's okay, we can go. That was ours off of paper, same thing. You're like, okay, that, that's a spot. Yeah, good enough. Yeah, it's all, it, it hasn't seen any sulfur, so it's okay. Yeah. You do it. You know, <laughs> I love those long, cool ferments they create. Complex wine, so they just kind of let it go, you know. And if it it's always we we bottle the Grenache Blanc right before harvest for just because it's let's not push it, let's just let it do its thing. And yeah. I mean, we could probably inoculate it with some super yeast and get it burned through quickly, but it kind of defeats the object of what we do. With it, both from my personal, mostly I'm told to the Creek here, long slow ferment, let it do its thing. I mean, when I first first started with with Talos and was talking to Francois about what we're doing. He was like fist pounding the table. You don't have yeast and you don't have nutrients. Yeah. I know you're going to be nervous and I know you're going to sweat, but you wait and, mm -hmm. and you let them take their time. I'll be back. Well, it's, you just got to be careful. It's funny, that was, don't let them go bad. It's like, well, come on. That was, that was Brad this year. I mean, I give you credit because that was Brad. I mean, I hadn't done, you know, I hadn't been on the native train for a while. You know, I kind of got off that native mm -hmm. job for about you know, five, six years. And we're like, okay, that's what we're doing. I'm like, okay, you know, and to me, it wasn't the reds were, were great, but I, I had a, I really did have a pretty good idea of what they were going to be. Um, and only just because you know, it's not that different, you know, whether you do commercial yeast to go through full yeah. ML, it, you know, but you know, you can start seeing some more of the change. But on the whites, it was a very different animal, you know, when you let all native primary, all native secondary, that's a very different, that's a very different wine, yeah, it's a hundred percent different. And it's a, it's a, oh, dude, you're waiting. Well, especially when you're like, you got a depletion driven thing. You're like, dude, we're about to run out of white wines. I got shit I need to sell. <laughs> and we're doing that. You know, it's always an issue for us with Vermentino because you got Jason needing it for the market. Springtime shipment. Totally. Yeah. Vermentino's in it. And it's like you're in December and it's still sweet. And now it's started. Like, That's part of the reason. And I'm not going to heat it up. And I'm not going to hit it with. Or some super champagne used to burn it through. I'm just gonna sit there and wait. So that was part of the reason why the Big Bull ended up being bottled earlier because I mean everything else was still working. They were like, Big Bull's done. Bull's ready. <laughs> Let's do it. Rose. All right, you're on. <laughs> and it happens. And I mean, to the credit of, of Thomas and Jason and his dad, it's like if it's not ready, it's just not ready, and we'll put something else in. Absolutely. Let's try and get it ready. And that's what we're gonna do. If we can, it would be nice. Totally. I know I'm with you, and the funny, and I, I well, and I enjoyed that part of the conversation with your clientele and your and your customers and your club. They're like, hey, man, I'm not, I'm gonna create these products for you, but I can't create it just for a time frame. Mm -hmm. You know, like, hey, man, we're we're building a program, and next year it might be a little different. You know, maybe the the season will be different, and, and the wines will evolve a little bit differently, and we'll 
well, you'll see these earlier and then you'll see these later, but you know, as long as they kind of connect with you on that same yeah, ideology. If you, if you understand, if the, if the customer understands what we're doing and why we're doing it, we're trying to make wines that are respecting the land and showing the soil and showing for, for Tavlis at least, showing why these people came here and bought property when everyone thought they were going to buy a Napa or Sonoma. Yeah. If we want to display that in a bottle of wine, then we got to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. We can't pick a, a commercial yeast that's going to give this certain mouthfeel or this certain aroma or this is going to dry up this or it's going to dry up this. Like, that's not the point for what we're doing. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I get that. Yeah. And I, I absolutely respect people who do that. The Towels Creek model has always been this. And it's like, okay, that's what we're going to do. So customers have become involved. So, look, we didn't get to it in our ship. It's like, well, it wasn't up. It wasn't ready yet. It wasn't ready. We'll give it to you. When you're ready. <laughs> totally. You yeah. gotta trust us all this one. <laughs> well, and the, and the wine show, and, and it's it's honestly as a winemaker, it's more it's more fun when you get to be when you get that opportunity. You don't have to feel like you're 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 I don't know. I guess selling out to selling out to the idea. You're like, hey man, that's and, 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 and invariably you're always you taste the wine like oh, good. You're like you're like thank God I'm glad it's it's a better wine. And those whites. 100% this year on 2020 for us. I was like, you love them? I'm loving them because we did. And we, and, you know, we can, what you there? We can try to, we can try to clear that next. Hey, Ian, I'm going to be on professional now and speak to Ian, the facilitator. I can't see questions. So if you want to use the LA stuff to us, because yeah. I can't. We're spitballing, so it's all good. Uh, so we'll say, oh, our summer temperatures have been unseasonably cool and so cloudy cloudy and drizzle. What's happening with the wise and best rolls? expected weather this is from deborah well it's been we all thought it was going to be an early vintage and it is going to be early we're going to pick our first pick on monday and it'll be one day earlier than last year so it's early yeah. it's been a pretty temperate year it hasn't been super hot this week has been super strange it went hot for about two weeks it was in the hundreds now we're in the 80s and 90s, we almost, almost weird. Set, I mean, my place is the 70s all day. It never got over 80. And we're seeing overcast, and we're seeing a little smoky haze in the air from all the stuff that's burning, not enough to affect grapes, but let's hope it stays that way. Yeah. You know, and everyone always is predicting from the moment of bud breaks, say, oh, it's going to be this. And it's like, you don't know that until you see what the weather brings, what Mother Nature throws at us. You know, if it, if it gets hot for a month, it's going to change the program one way or another. So, uh, it's been what I'm seeing the vineyard. You, it, it's never unique to the vin our vineyard, but I'm seeing s smaller berries, lighter berries. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a little bit of a lighter crop than we think because there's plenty of clusters on the vine. They're just not. They're just not big berries, and they're they're kind of light feeling to me. Yeah. I think it'll be intense vintage. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it would be good, uh, assuming all goes well. It doesn't suddenly be under uh, yeah, that's, 15 for that's a the, month. The, the How it looks now. It's a million dollar question. Is like, yeah, what happens these next like four weeks? But yeah, I'm with you. Like, you know, you know, we were all kind of betting that it was going to be a little bit behind. But then when it started to color up and Verasion hit, it went fast. So like, okay, well, it's going to be a short crop. I mean, it's like if the vine doesn't have to work real hard to color it up real fast, you realize that the weight's not there. And the vines still look good. That's one thing I like well, about this. Look great. Yeah. We're seeing we're seeing healthy looking vines, mm -hmm. but I I just feel like I'm seeing smaller berries, particularly yeah. in like, Syrah and Grenache, mm -hmm. especially. I'm noticing it, which is you know maybe a good thing. We'll see. Well, yeah. it's a classic. We see what the vintage brings, and there's you know much as much history as I've got working on that property. It's like until I smell it fermenting in the fermenter, I'm not going to make. Big predictions, but yeah, well, and I, and I look I'm at sure it, that doesn't answer that question at all. But that's as good as I <laughs> it's, it's historically, you look at your drop vintages nine times out of ten are some of the best vintages we have. Yeah, and it's, it's very few vintages that were drop vintages that turned, but we turn can't up. keep having them because otherwise, we won't have them. Well, it's the flip flop, you know. But actually, some of the wetter vintages have been nicer of late. Um, no, I was talking to Mikey from Scar of the Sea, mm -hmm. and he's buying grapes. From Cucamonga. Ah, down in um, uh, LA. Orange East County. Of LA. Well, I guess that's right. Is that San I don't know exactly. Riverside County, maybe? So they, they yeah, were, yeah, yeah. these vines were planted in like 1904 or 1960. Didn't Art Norma used to buy that stuff? I don't know. But I remember that. Art Norma, if it's in the dough, Art used to buy that. But it's dry farm, head train, in sand, and they had three inches of rain. That's kind of standard. Mm -hmm. They've never sprayed it. 
and it's still producing fruit. Hmm. You know, so it gives you hope that we're not in sand, we're in clay and limestone, which holds and retains water. moisture. I think we can get away with more than we think. You know, I was always led to believe 25 inches and you can dry farm. It's like, yeah, I think we can go a little uh, less than that. If the spacing is right. If you're, yeah. if you're dry farming at three by three, you're going to be in trouble. Well, that. honestly, I, went, I just went through my field and I, and I, yeah. It's so one of those funny things too, where you're like, you, you kind of just lay it out there as a farmer, like, hey, all right, we're going to, we're going to make a, and actually I, I was starting to worry about water in general and because my well's not very deep so my and i was watering earlier in the season on my my trellis block the dry farm head i, I haven't watered how deep is your one uh 150 uh, yeah deep. so there ain't much there so i was like okay i, I need to conserve just for the winter um so i i just said okay i'm just gonna stop watering all together until i told the guys I'm like hey when you go through it's just based on shoot length Let's just do it at that. Let's just yeah. make it simple. Let's make it easy. If you got this much length, if you got this much length, you got this much length. This will mm -hmm. this will cater to how much, uh, how many clusters I want you to keep. And they were literal about it. <laughs> and I was like, huh, that was a lot on the ground. Not a ton, <laughs> but I mean, because my my, my vineyard doesn't throw a ton. But it was they were very literal and they were judicious about it. And I can't tell you how much the vines responded to it. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, I was like, my vines look. Probably better than they ever have. I mean, I got some spots where the, the canes were a little short, only because they didn't get the water. But they're not reaching anymore. But they're, they're lignifying really well, and they're not shutting down. I'm noticing in some spots around, just just eyeballing some things, you can tell there are some peeps that have been leaving some fruit on. That you know, on years like this, you, you even though it's still a light crop. You still got to look at it as fine by fine, like, you know, you, the, the pounds per plant make a big oh, difference yeah. this year. I mean, yeah. and, and that's and that's just going to help the vine sustain. It's going to get into deeper moisture and, and it'll be able to recover for next year because, you know, some of them, I mean, if you push them too hard this year, I mean, next year you're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be fighting it next year. Totally. I mean, it, it's always vine by vine, right? But that's a hard thing to do when you go a lot of acreage. Yeah. Well, and the water and the water's crappier now too. I mean, no matter what, I mean, the you know this the type of year like this year, if you're really pumping water, you're just getting you know low draw. You're getting you know water that's that's basically been drawn down a lot a, a lot more. So the water's going to get harder, harder, more minerals, more minerals, more salts, salts the whole bit. So okay. it's like you'll see vines if they're still trying to carry a crop right now. You'll, you'll, right. Yeah, you'll see those vines start. So to better for the dry farm to live off of rainwater. So Frank Mesta said, Neil, Rancho Pucuma is where a tribute to Grace, who he knows I'm a big fan of, mm -hmm. Angela Osborne, yep. gets some of her ganache. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's great. She does a good job and stuff. So talk about this wine a little bit. Uh, so, a little bit more yeah. In a short time. Sorry about that. I didn't know. I thought, oh, you're right. I was the wine guy. <laughs> so this is Claret and um, Claret Blanc. So obviously, uh, I think uh, one of my... Coolest experiences that I ever did. Yeah, what yeah was you talk? I'll read here. One of the cool experiences I had, you know, I call this holiday because there's always. Originally, it was our Albarino if I made this wine, um, but it ended up being Claret because invariably I'd always go on holiday. You know, it's a very European term of traveling, and so I go on holiday and I'd always find these white varietals. I really do, truthfully, drink white wine more than I drink it. And so I'd go on holiday and chasing a white wine. Um, first, it was Albarino going to um, Galicia and, and trying all those Albarinos, and I was really enamored by it. Do you go to Bakersfield on holiday anymore? No, I do. I do, but um, I don't tend to find wine, white wines as substance. No, no. <laughs> My old hometown. Um, <laughs> Baco. Yes. That is that is the tagline for me with Neil. Baco Barton. Baco Barton. So explain that a little bit, because who knows? You have Grey Wolf, which we know you for, mm -hmm. and they have Barton. I think for us, it's a family namesake. You know, really wanted to kind of bring... Sure, where do they... Uh, What's the difference? Well, I think that originally, I think with Grey Wolf, we always wanted it... You know, it was really just a starting point. It was a launch point. It was at that that winery at, at the old Baron Vineyard when we started. We, we weren't by ourselves. You know, we were partnering with the landowner. And so we didn't want to have our, our, our family name be the namesake because it wasn't all us at that point. Right. And then uh, Grey Wolf stuck. It did well. And everybody was, you know, um, we got a good following. So, okay, let's run with it. 
And as I got further on in my kind of part of it, I started veering into the things that I wanted to get into. You know, you, you know Grable yeah. had started making wines that, you know, I mean, you can go back to those early 90s, I wouldn't say Andy Cab, Merlot, and these things that were, were, were basically, you know, the things that we sold then and that were in good, and that's what people wanted out of Paso Wines. But then as I started trying, you know, like mm. I, I was at one of those first tastings when you guys first released the top of the screen, and I was like, oh, this is super interesting. And I, and I knew Grenache and, and I knew Rhone's were going to be the thing in Paso. So I started chasing those things. And then as I was going on holiday, I started to, you know, when I would travel in Europe, I would go and try to find obscure things, things mm -hmm. that were interesting. And I didn't see in Paso that I knew that I might have an opportunity. Albarino was the first one. I truly sure think maybe Albarino is not as fit for here as maybe uh, of those, some of these Rome yeah. I've made it and I like it. I like it. I don't, I don't necessarily, I mean, once you go to Portugal and you go to Galicia, you will see a very different eyeball yeah. of Albarino. Sure. Um, and then once I got here, then when I went to Chef Enough, then that, that was the eye opener of drinking white wines. Like I got lucky enough, or I was with some friends, and we went to some very random producer tasting in downtown Chef Enough. And all I did that whole time was taste white. Right. I'm like, okay, I want to taste these whites. And so, and so much of it was claret and bourbon. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is a, this is a game changer. Yeah. <laughs> this is an eye opener. These wines are textural. You know, I do love a good Chardonnay. My like white burgundies is probably literally my aha, uh -huh, like when I think it is for most of us. Yeah, you're like, that's yeah. amazing. Oh my God. We can't I, do that. I will push that dollar in. <laughs> <laughs> like, did yeah. you just spend 1200 bucks? And I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it. It was worth every penny. <laughs> Steve, Steve Edmonds is in. We've got Roman royalty in the can. Hey, Steve. Yeah, I shave my beard and my head <laughs> once a year, whether I need it or not. Oh yeah, it's coming, yeah, it's coming on harvest. Uh, but yeah, that was the, the, the claret thing, and this is a uh, lucky enough that uh, kind of got into it with um, uh, you know not sure why claret was became kind of a popular thing for us all to chase here, mm -hmm. but lucky enough um, um, with uh, the Ducies and, and McPrice, you know um, they put a nice little spot on their Baker Street vineyard and cool exposure, you know, nice kind of a west. Straight west facing, so heavier soil. Paper Street's kind of up on Kyler Canyon, right? Yeah, Hi. almost like straight across from Glen Rose. from Glen Rose. Um, you know, basically, but just on the the south uh, the south side of, of Kyler. And like I say, this particular um, exposure is almost directly west. I mean, not almost even northwest. Mm -hmm. So it's actually got some pretty heavy. Um, dirt towards the bottom, and then it's got you know a lot of exposure on top. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> and and the funny thing is, is like, I mean, it, it's late. It's certainly one of our later white picks. I mean, Big Mike's like, when are we when are we getting this? Well, it's kind of interesting because Glen Rose is always pretty early for us. Anyway, Tal was Glen Rose is like two or three weeks ahead of us normally. And it is a lot of the rest of the stuff. I mean, all the all the Rones and the Zen are some of the, are some of the first picks. Mm -hmm. The claret, it's just it's it's nothing but two to six o'clock sun. Okay. So it's really morning sun protected. Right. So nice. it, so it really does kind of you know get a lot more hang time that way. Um, and there's Grenache Blanc that's on the top of the hill above it. That's one of the first picks. And so Grenache Blanc is one of the first picks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it will and just it's on a hot it's on a hotter slope. Really, really a lot of mineral up there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you're you're fighting the acid and you're fighting the uh, you're fighting the ripeness up there a little bit. But the wines are getting older, so now they're starting to kind of be able to protect themselves. So that was planted what like seven eight years ago. I think that was two thousand two thousand twelve. Okay, so yeah, eleven or twelve. I think twelve. I think so. Nine years ago. Yeah, my cool. my, my cool. Being a lot of good wines coming out of there. And very young. I mean, you're, you're still just seeing what it's going to be, especially since I buy stuff from Glen Rose and Paper Street at the same time. Very different animals. So, we're going to talk about Dizzy's bit with the red wine, right? Yes. Okay, so let's not talk about Yeah, yeah. So but, let's talk about this. Let's talk about production. Well, I think what was, was nice about this is we did... Braddy. Let's talk about Braddy. We'll talk, we talk about, about Braddy for half an hour? Yeah, no, yeah. let's not. Not, not quite a half an hour. Maybe we'll, we'll, give him, we'll give him a couple minutes, though. 
Um, he's busy. Yeah, he's he's getting married this weekend. So congratulations, yeah. Braddy. We'll, we'll, congratulations, we'll, Braddy. We can go throw him under the bus tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna get fat, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's gonna lean up, man. He's drinking his shakes. Yeah, he's probably you know, good. Gym, riding his bike. Yeah, he's <laughs> trim. <laughs> um, but this was the one where I think what we did on our side was. Um, we wanted to take Claret because, you know, um, he had worked for Julian um, at Baroche and he wanted to make that whole style of Claret, you know, like, the, well, of course, Julian makes like one punch and it's like all brand new wood. We weren't right. like chasing that. There's a bit of wood on this, though. Yeah, right? but, we, but we, we did one, I think we ended up having six barrels, one of which was new. Um, and it was a light long, so we, we, we tried to be uh, respective of it and try mm -hmm. to overplay it. Um, but wanted to take this one 100% through primary and secondary. And it took a very long, progressive time. But we wanted to see that evolution, that richness, you know, all those change, elongate, and, and not. And we, we, we considered stopping it short, you know, just because mm -hmm. Claret, you know, at least from that. Stopping the mallet short. Yeah, we were considering it, and we were all along the way, we we're wondering, man, should we, should we not? Um, but we did want to see the full evolution, and we did. We wanted to to go, you know, you know, unfiltered, and, and, and really have all that textural profile. Mm -hmm. And there are some. There's a, there's a couple twice used in there as well. So I mean, I think the oak play was no, that's a nice balance to me. Yeah, and I think we wanted to we wanted it to be that style. And I think for us, claret, you know, for lack of a better term, for Paso, could be that white burgundy, that white. That white wine that can carry that wood mm -hmm. and be elegant and be you know substantial, substantial. and rather than just you know you know not you know can be you, you can make a claret a lot of different ways too. Sure, yeah. sure. I mean they, they do a lot of they do good sparkling claret. Right, the D, I think Rousson carries the wood for us the best. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same level of acidity and brightness. It's a little richer. Yeah, but it can. It can cover the wood for sure. Yeah, so that was one that we because we have you know we have a nice Grenache Blanc, we have a, a nice pit bull, we have a Viennese that are kind of in the middle. For us, if we were going to have a texture of white, this would have been the one. Mm -hmm. That's why we kind of chased it that way. That's and we did make the pet net out of Claret, and that was that was a that was that oh, oh, man. Nice, Brad. Thanks for so, that. You can try it to Brad's yeah, Brad. Brad's gonna be buddy, buddy tomorrow yeah. night because we're pretty. That's why you didn't bring you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nice. So to clarify for people, Brad worked for for Tablas Creek for a, a couple three harvests maybe I'm not sure how many he's gonna be mad that I didn't know that number then he went away to Carmel for some strange reason and realized he missed us so much he came back and he's been making wine for Joe now well, it's, 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 it's be a second second vintage second vintage he's got a feet on the ground now he's getting married tomorrow so yeah he's, he's probably not watching this no no he's not actually he, he said he's gonna record it for later yeah, so um but no and this is honestly clear I I I'm going like we were talking about. I really do want to plant more of this. And then there are a lot of people planting more of this in town. You're going to plant some on Ridge Road, right? Yeah. And, um, but I think there's, you're seeing more men around town like Pitbull is. I think we're yeah. finding that is for this area, Paso, especially, you know, it's not all over the whole region, um, but I think it could be, you know, one of the signature white varieties. I think it kind of snuck its way in a little before Pitbull into the state, you know, because Tom was brought in, but I thought it was just, I think it might have been someone else called. Got it first, or I had it before we did. Mm. I love it. Let's go to that Kunwa's. Are we, are we changing the stemware? Yes, we oh, are. this is a pro joint. It is. Oh, sorry. It's the only two nice big glasses I got left because they're all broken. All right, we're going to the camera. So, 2019 Tavos Creek Kunwa's, uh, which I'm told by authority. Is on special right now at Tavos Creek. So it is September September to remember in Kunwama. <laughs> so get you know, over there online on Tavos Creek and pick up your, your Kunwas. Kunwa to me is the unsung hero. It's a great bottle of wine at the regular price. So if you're getting money off, then why wouldn't you? What's my discount? You don't get a discount. Damn it. Ooh. I haven't had this since it's been involved. So we make a little bit of Kunwa as well. Such a pretty great, such a such an easy friend. So what's the slope? I, I know I, you, you drove me around the other day, and I don't know if we actually saw where the slope of the Kunwa was. Kunwa is the most of the Kunwa is on. It's kind of knoll in the middle of the property. 
Okay. It's not really knolls. The hill comes down. It's like, so it faces south and it faces west and it faces, faces kind of this. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was one of the original plantings from the Tabas Creek material. It's a bit of a haggard vineyard. It's old and it's been ravaged a little bit by various things as things do, frost and gophers. But it makes such a beautiful wine and and it really in a great Kumas year really makes the Esprit the best it can be, is always my opinion. Mm -hmm. So even though it's only like five percent, seven percent, whatever Kumas in that in that wine, and it's mostly more bad than this Syrah grass. So it's it, you know Kumas doesn't seem like it would make that much difference, but when it's great, then the Esprit is a mm -hmm. notch above in my opinion. Yeah. And it can be light and some years it's it's super light and super pretty and it's not that imp and then years like this it's just got this it's still pretty but it's got a it carries itself with some with some class and a little bit of weight mm -hmm. i think you know super pretty fruit nose and the texture is beautiful we're planting more we don't have enough of it so we just planted another big chunk on a new spot on the new on jewel ridge mm -hmm. probably about three acres of Dry farm 12 by 12, so that's mm -hmm. going to be super exciting. Yeah. There, that's on a what would that be? That's like a southeast facing slope, so it's pretty shady. Or it's kind mm -hmm. of in a in a cool area. It's going to be interesting because it ripens fairly late, so yeah, it's going to have a long season. So I think it's going to do really well in that. I'm be curious because I, 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 you know, we've been making kunwa from Glen Rose for I guess like about six years now, and it's literally one of my favorites every year, and we only you know, we only really end up getting three punchings of it every year. So I make two punchings of what I call the hot blooded, and then we take the other punch and we blend it with Grenlo Grenache and okay. make it what we call Calvin Love. And two of my favorite wines. I love these styles of wine. I love the fact that, it's, that it is fragrant. It is, and it, juicy is a, 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 I think is a, not a, doesn't give it its due. Like it's, there's, there's these light, little, soft, elegant moments to mm -hmm. it, and you know, if you don't, if you don't appreciate that. It doesn't have to be a bomber. It doesn't have to be a big wine. It just really uh, give you what you're. Think, what thank you're goodness for. that's changing at the moment. Mm -hmm. The people have tended to it almost like they feel like Pinot Noir is the only wine that is allowed to be that way. Oh, I can you know, totally agree. Like, uh, oh, that's just Pinot Noir territory. Well, it's so, well, it's it's funny because so I have to describe that. That's how I describe it to people. I'm all well. It has a weight and the texture of the Pinot Noir. And that's the best way to, to do it. And you're, and you're right. It's like, it's not, there's there's more than just Pinot Noir out there. Look at this one. It's amazing. Yeah. Or not it's not Pinot Noir. Yeah. It's like, it's better. It's brighter. And <laughs> 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 At least in our neighborhood. Often well, pretty. Yeah, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't disagree. But yeah. what, you find Pinot Noirs on that new piece? Uh, not. We can go head to head with Pinot Noir. Well, I, I Pinot think Pinot I'm, my particular piece, I, I'd have to just, I, I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, if there's enough stone there, you know, um, I don't know if there's all that heavier soil profile or bring you some, <laughs> Do it, cool. I, but I do want to, I, I want to see it in there. I want to see Kun Wong, I want to see um, Moved, and I, I want to see it really well there. in there. I really do. Uh, That's what I'm curious. It's such a cool, such a cool grape, right? I mean, beautiful floral, rose petally nose, but just a real texture not in a tannic hard no. texture it's just it's a beautiful texture on the palate i'd like to see more people grow it and the funny thing is is that there is so much more opportunity it's one of those things where if you want to convince a grower because you know it's always you know especially an independent grower like hey you know i want to plant this 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 and this because it makes me money sure but kumwa is one of those that it may not command the very highest price for the grapes but the yield dynamic will bounce that out. You know, even some of these white grapes, you look at it too, you're like, hey, you know, you may not get, you know, the ultra premium price because you keep, you know, planting, you know, let's just, let's throw cab out there. You're like, oh, well, if you just farm this cab, you're gonna get the highest price you're gonna get in this region, but you're also gonna be fighting the yield, you know? So if you could get a, you know, I feel like people are, could grow more of this knowing that you are going to make up with it with a, a good yield and high quality, but your customers are going to be. But we're we're a little more focused on your clientele, so it's always tricky. 
I think we're moving in a good direction on that front because we've been we've just been living through a period, in my opinion, that wine isn't worth a lot of money if it's not massive and dark and heavy and red, hundred percent. And so a, a light pretty wine isn't worth as much as a super thick, heavy. Yeah. Dark. And it's like that. That's a shame because I don't think that's true. No. I think they're both of the same value. They're just very different. They fall in different areas, and so. Again, Pinot Noir can get away with that. You know, the most expensive wine on the planet is probably Burgundy. Yeah. Right? Or maybe Bordeaux, but Burgundy. It's and it's light and pretty. And But apart from that CR, particular yeah. one re region on the planet, if it's light and pretty, and it's not worth as much as something that's dark and rich. And because we've been through this period of that, and that's changing slowly, which is, which is great. I mean, in fact, that you're planting these things is a great thing. When I want to plant them because it, it's, it's because 20 years ago you weren't looking at that. No, no. Well, I, you had an inkling of it. You had, you had, you know, I, you I knew I, it might be coming, but you knew you weren't going to, you weren't going to get a great score well, and you, for a Kuma. And, and you, you probably and, still won. And, and the funny thing is trying to sell that to the customer base at that time. You know, I mean, well, we tried. I mean, God, you remember, I remember you guys doing it and I remember I tried to jump on it too. We were all trying to sell Rosé in like 2002, 2003 yeah. and everybody's like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't drink green and sweet, right? Pink is green. Now it's not white zen. I don't like white zen. You're like, no, 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 no. This is oh, how that's changed. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, I mean, it's right. like that progression is like, I mean, we all were into it then. And nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. And so now I feel like, you know, probably six, seven years ago, I was thinking Kunwa as just a blender. And now I love it as a stem one. Yeah. I just love Me it. Me too. I mean, Thomas, we do is blender for sure, do it by itself. And it I wish we had more. I wish we could make more. Loma Joan, I do Sanso Kumas blend, which is super pretty. Mm -hmm. And it sells well. You know, people are starting to go, oh, you know, I enjoy this. Well, there's such food wines. Yeah, and it's a different occasion. You, yeah. know, you don't want you want those big wines at a certain moment, at a certain meal, at a certain time. You want the lighter stuff with a different thing. But those, those different big, applications. Those big ones are just show dog. You know, yeah. it's just like it's after you eat. And you're like, all right, we're gonna all sit down, all right. and just almost like a digestive. You know, like this thing's a ball or can freaking drink the wine and let's 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 hang out and check it out. How the Danthus is always great. It is Danthus is the first rosé that we made. I'm gonna look at the camera. That's just no, the first. No, sorry. I keep. I think I keep looking down. I'm sorry. That's just the first rosé that we made, and we made 80 cases in 1999, and it was people just didn't know what to do with it at that time because it was a dry rosé, and mm -hmm. and you know where our parent company's from and where I just come back from and the Haas family. It's like why is there not dry rosé in Paso Robles? It's the wine that. Is needed the most. And it's, it will do very well. 100 degrees with it. Well, so you want a glass of rose? This is what we need. And we would go to the Roan Rangers tastings in San Francisco with that wine for a number of years, and we we're the only one there. Mm -hmm. You know, and there were people in Paso that were pulling juice sunnier from their red ferments. To make their reds redder and darker and pouring it down the drain. Oh, I know. Well, that's that's why I'm That's why I started distilling. Because I was like, we got to do something with this. We can't yeah. just be pouring this down the drain. Right. Now people are yeah. well, and then, right there, which is great because rosé is such a great thing. Well, I think too. I think what happened too is that everybody and that and, and I think at the beginning, I, unfortunately, maybe at the beginnings of what you know, pastoral bulls rosé is that we were doing something else, and mm. I don't think a lot of us, you know, me included, were as educated in high quality rosé. Production as I do now. I mean, now as far as farming for it, you know, bringing it in for rosé. You know, rather than going, yeah, I'll make a sangue and then that'll be a rosé. Well, that's not a rosé. I mean, that's a that's a that's a, a tool, but you don't have the acidity and you don't have the freshness. You don't have the reality of what a great rosé is. The, the terroir is there. Yeah. Um, we did that with. Um, but that's does a rosé really need to be? Eighty dollars a bottle? No, no, no. 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 It would be a really well-made bottle of wine, and it's, it should be accessible. Yeah. You know, to me, you know, there's a lot of. I'm sure you're probably obsessing on with that comment. No, I agree. It, it, it's it, a, it's a should be a happy, friendly wine. Well, look, at, look at white wines. I mean, white wines. You got all the spectrum. I mean, right. you know, I mean, we we're talking about white wines. I guess it can. Be. I guess yeah. there's a rosé and a Camino France at like two hundred bucks. Uh, yeah, they're there. I mean, we all, we all. What am I going to do? We, with we all got to town BA and all that stuff and. 
Yeah, but you're paying there for, I guess. Yeah, what? The little cat. And reputation yeah. being the ones that made us notice the Rose yeah. was a thing. You so, know, I mean, they're, they're benchmark. Oh, this could be good. Yeah, right. People will pay for that. You know, well, now we do because it's the uh, it's the client. Ryan Pease is buying it. So, <laughs> He's trying. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> so we get what Ryan Pease doesn't buy from Tom Brady nowadays. So, so. Well, you know, I think I find like it's like you get. We need to move on. To your red. Right. Oh God! All right, we're running out of time for you. You got to drive to the mall. Rest of my kid. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, so the, you know this is the, re the reason I did let's go back the reason I brought this because you know and I, I was thinking in the same ride as you as I was thinking old time you know four things and that's the same well you know I like expensive old yeah. you know, glass that's all I do yeah, let's go you know and so I was thinking about this idea that you know we were going to talk about old school Paso and I thought nothing better than to do something that you know I haven't always been. You know, working with the Ducey family as, as much as they do now, but obviously they're you know a family that is very well vested in this in this region, and this has some of the Dante Ducey in it as from the Zinfandel perspective. But the cool part about this is that it's also um, Movet from Paper Street, Tisera from from Matt's house, which is uh, Matt Ducey. Matt from his his house that's about three hills over. Um, Next to Forty Six West, right, you know, right behind the shopping center, mm -hmm. um, and then Syrah from Paper Street. So they they have been really investing in terroir themselves. You know, they're some of the original guys, but they've obviously went beyond just their original plantings. And so this was kind of a, a cool project to really start using fruit from multiple ranches that they do. Um, and they're all all these are are um, set the Syrah are all head trained. So yeah. Tees head trained. Moved's head train, the Zin's head train, the Sorrel's on a wire, just because Sorrel on a wire is a lot easier than Sorrel on a head train. Um, but stylistically, we tried to make this in a, in a way that we were very terroir driven. Um, there's a little bit of American oak, so we kind of got that, you know, that a little bit of that ridge play. Um, you know, um, we should mention ridge. I mean, the ridge Benito Ducey, Paso Robles, Zinfandel is 100% from Benito Ducey's. Mm -hmm. Benito no longer with us for what, 10 years or something. So Benito passed, but Dante, whose brother, and that mm -hmm. probably still goes, and Jay Doozy, Janelle's property, she's doing great stuff with Zin, making some great Zinfandels. Yeah. Well, I, the idea of Zinfandels changed. I think we all cut our teeth, at least I did on Zinfandel. Yeah. Um, well, back to that. You know, when your dad first came here, that's what was here. That's what we did. Zin or Cab. We had made a red wine. Zin or Cab. We had Zinfandel festivals. Right. <laughs> exactly. you know? Oh, my God. I can't believe I didn't bring the picture. Oh man, I got one of the old um, Zimbabwe Festival um, Paderewski pictures that we all signed. Oh, I got it. <laughs> God, I can't believe I didn't bring it. Hey, it was when I was on there. Yeah, you were in that. You were in that photo with my dad. With your dad? Yes. Wow. That was probably in. I didn't know I ever met your dad. Nineteen ninety-seven. Wow. I think so. No, it have been six or seven. Because I was gone, I left um, April first of '97. So probably was six or seven for a year, so probably six. Probably six. Yeah, because that was when you were so that way, right? See that? Yeah. yeah. Man, I should have brought that. I forgot about that. Because I was naming everybody. You know, because I have this. It's it's part of our photo album, and then we have it at the winery that I show people, and I and, and I start naming all the people. I'm like, you know, that's that person. I mean, some of these people are alive. Who's that young guy? Yeah, it's like, who's that guy? I'm all, that's Neil. I'm like, I can barely recognize him. <laughs> well, this is cool. This is, this is big. It's big Zinfandel. It's rich, fruity, pretty. Can I get the American note, which I like. I think Zin kind of should be an American note. I think West Side. Kind of a rich Greek, so I get that. I like, how, great variety. I like how, well, those Cantons. So you can you can pick yeah. up the Cantons. You, you know, that was kind of the flavor that, that, um, uh, we kind of pulled out of it back when we were kind of getting into the the Osgood, you know. Yeah. We, so when I started doing Osgood, we started grabbing those Cantons, yeah. and then those kind of started to slide yeah, into barrel. they started to slide into the um, the Ducey program, and they do actually. It's funny, Osgood and Dante Ducey are very similar, even though I mean geographically they're human beings <laughs> or the property. <laughs> 
I don't know. <laughs> no, they, they, actually, old Big Mike and um, Dave, they're not that different. They know each other. Yeah, they're not that different, oddly enough. They're right there, and they're both guys I love to walk into the vineyard and start chatting with. Yeah. And, and, and get and just have conversations with. I don't want to talk about vines as much. Let's just talk about the weather. It's, it always starts with that. You start talking about the weather, you start talking about that, and then it just kind of evolves. Then we start talking about old times. I can have this conversation with my favorite David. I was good moment. He walked these, we're doing a vineyard tour with our wine club in his vineyard, and he's, you know, He's got his jeans on, no shoes or socks. No. He's got his denim shirt that's covered in oil, open down to his belly button. And he walks up to me and he looks at me and goes, Summer of Love, I was there and it was good. <laughs> like, what did you just say to me, Dave? Summer of Love, I was there, it was good. I was an usher at the Monterey Fall Festival. And I'll um, give you a good I'll bet you that was good. I'll give you a good Oscar story. So, same thing. We're talking, we're walking. It's just, I think it's just, it was just, it might have actually been Ryan, and he's talking. We're looking at stuff. I'm like, "What's that?" He's like, "Oh, that's that. That's that novel weed thing. You know, the furry one." So, don't eat that. I'm all on. I don't eat that. <laughs> yeah, he's like, "That's the one you gotta be careful of." He's like, "So, a buddy of mine made a tea of that." Four days later, he woke up from San Jose jail with a nail in his foot. I'm all, oh, that's good to know. <laughs> I'll, I'll skip that. Yeah. Come on, we're we're, we're pass on that. Come on, the spirit glasses. <laughs> and, 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 oh, God, I'd have those with, with crowd. Steve, Steve yeah. would have all those freaking stories. Yeah. And then Osgood's special. Yeah, Osgood's are special stories. And the Heatons, you know, the Neil and, yeah. and um, oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I'm Jenny. Jenny. Jenny, she got that, that, that day she got um, she got a trance love off the company because she was picking. And she's all, ah, I was like, yeah, you look like you're kind of uncomfortable. Like, oh, my God, pick another day. And a trance look I've been there and just bit me all over. You know, she poked, pulls her shirt and seed, and I'm like, yeah, that's all right. I'm good. I'm like, I'll take your word for it. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> you know, God, that, that, that was getting to you know, those stories about, you know, these families, I mean, these are real, the real families that 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 the, the people we like to buy from. Oh, well, they started this area. Yeah, they they were, and this was their home. I mean, you talk to Neil Heaton, he's like, man, I, yeah. they, I that was going into town was wasn't going to town yeah. very often. So the ravages, same yeah. thing. The dogs who we buy from, yeah, right, from, yeah, you know, they, yeah, they they're like, like when we don't, we don't town, where's town? Yeah. yeah, dirt road back then. Mm -hmm. So we're we're pushing time, so I'm gonna go over here. So we're gonna take shots. We're gonna take shots. <laughs> All right. So that's how we finish. It's colder. So look at the camera. So Joe owns a, a distillery, Crowbar. I do have a bottle of Crowbar. I don't know where to put it with the camera. There. It is. That's my barrel aged gin. We should try that after we. Have we our... will oh, for when we're off camera. So. I own a cider facility, Bristol Cider House. We make cider. And so, you know, you don't have to think too long about that situation. Mm -hmm. So we made cider and Joe distilled it. He kept half, I kept half. 30 gallon barrel, he put his 30 gallon barrel his, in a bourbon barrel, an old bourbon barrel that had been used a few times. Mm -hmm. uh, once used. Once used, we put ours in a barrel that contained uh, Zinfandel from the Bailey Ranch for about four to six months, I don't remember. Pulled the Zin A. Another Zin guy. And so we have... <laughs> Another character. We have them both here. And, <laughs> and let's get this yeah, yeah, yeah. rubbish out of the way. And you can see different color. I got Scott who's, a, who's, a, who's my GM now, so I love the I love the English terms. Out. It's this, is, this is this is the Del Barrel, so you can kind of see the thing. So let's we haven't tried these since the yeah, first 15 minutes ago. Let's do the Zen first, which is very different. I mean, you know, that was kind of the thing for me. It's like uh, so it's twice distilled. So if you just really kind of want to wrap your head around the distillation process, uh, most distillations are um, are twice, no matter what. You're gonna do a strip run, or we call it, get a low wine. And then secondary a spirit run when you get a high wine, um, and so this was twice as still um, kind of came off at about one fifty five on the finished proof, um, you know, with cuts included, and then we brought it down to one twenty to to eight, 
And you find that 120 is a real magic number for, for aging because you get extraction, but you didn't go, you don't get over extraction. Um, you know, alcohol is kind of a solvent. Um, so it can, <laughs> and it gets to 190, it can pretty much clean anything. Uh, so I think that was kind of the idea. It was like, you know, when you get it to 120, it's, it's more of a subtle pull. Um, and you know, we could have probably cut this down further and, and the extraction might not have been as intense. I don't know. But at the same time, it gives it a chance to really kind of pull in and grab it. So this is my first foray into doing this, and I didn't understand a single word of what you just said. But it's tasting pretty good, and I, I know Calvados, and I know Apple Brandies from the Somerset Brandy Company very well. And it's reminiscent of that. I don't smell Zinfandel in this particularly. You said you did earlier, but... I did a little bit. Well, the granny came, came across really well. That's what that was the one kind of. It's one hundred percent granny Smith. Yeah. So during during the whole distillation process, I was really super surprised that not surprised, but I was I was happy that that granny profile stayed true and it really yeah. came across um, because that's what really defines an apple brand. Is that you really do get to chase the apple. It's a hard thing for me to, I mean, you, you talk about this and it's so, it's like so spirit and so, it's when like you start doing that, you taste the granny so a little I, cinnamon profile. I'm kind of getting it, but mm -hmm. it's a whole different game to taste the wine. And I've never really drunk any whiskey in my time, so it's new to me. This <laughs> So you're not drinking whiskey, you're drinking brandy. I have drunk booze in my time. You're a windy, you're, well, you're a cider guy. Bristol, he's a Bristol's guy. <laughs> he's a what, scrumpy? Was that a scrumpy? scrumpy? Yeah, a lot of scrumpy. A lot of so the bourbon barrel. So, I Neil, like the color. I'm a little jealous of the color. Neil was certain that I was making a gigantic mistake uh, in this in a bourbon barrel. But I might still own you this Yeah, I might. I haven't. We haven't gone to fruition. Um, I like the secondary uh, bourbon or, or whiskey barrels um, only just because, honestly, I don't think it's the the, uh, the primary spirit that went in there. I think it's the char because they're they're yeah. like they're like barrels um, or wine barrels. You're going to get some secondary pull out of the third and second and third fill. Um, so I'm still getting kind of a secondary pull out of this char. I believe this is a, a number three char. Maybe, different, different. No, nobody knows what you're talking about. Different than wine barrels are toasted. Barrels are charred. And so they look like gator skin. So one on the inside. One, it looks like you. It's just black. Two, it looks like it's kind of like charcoal. Three, it looks like gator skin. Four, it looks like it's gonna just completely fall apart. <laughs> and so that's the char levels. There's one, two, three, and four. Yeah. When well, we first bought bourbon barrels for cider, I never dealt with it before. It's Kind of the good old days, we bought these bourbon barrels and they showed up and they still had bourbon in them. <laughs> and so I uh nobody nobody from the TTV is asking. <laughs> <laughs> so I drained the mag. See, we drained it out and drank it. Me being me. Being. <laughs> like, what is that liquid in here? And drain them into five gallon buckets. And I, I couldn't believe it because I was used to wine barrels, I've never dealt with bourbon barrels, and there was charcoal floating around mm -hmm. and stuff. I mean, chunks of charcoal. Mm -hmm. So I filtered it okay. through the lap filter. We had 375 mm -hmm. mLs of, of bourbon barrel. barrel strength. It was great. Nice. So it doesn't happen anymore, neither. Both no, dry. yeah, you're, yeah. you're lucky if they, hold, they, if they hold liquid. So I think yours is a little prettier than ours right now. Um, well, and you're going to get that kind of sweet. More vanilla. You're going to get this. You're going to get the sweetness from from the char. I didn't like saying that. I know it's okay. I let you do it. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a big day. I actually only said that to make me seem like I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> only once. <sighs> mm. Cheers. Thanks for doing this. It's what is it? It's six oh nine. So oh, we're over at nine. We've taken up people's Friday night. Your daughter is halfway to the long post by now. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Joe. Thank you, my friends. Everybody, everybody out there tuning in. Thanks, Tuna. I hope I hope you learned some interesting stuff here. Joe, go visit him. Go buy some kumas, which is apparently on special. Mm -hmm. And next next guy up is Mike Siner, which yeah. Yeah, that's the same. That's the there's, same cut of tea. Right? There is a character. So look him up. He makes wine for ancient peaks and Sainer Levaye, I think is how he would say that. 
Ocean, ocean Vineyard? Is it, is it Ocean Vineyard? Bossy. A mile from the ocean. And have a little yeah, bossy. Yeah. We're mine some Grenache from him this year. Wow. Yeah, like fun. Have a bucket, I think we'll get. But anyway, cheers. Cheers. Uh, we're going to enjoy some some bourbon barrel aged Calvados. Four, five, six, nine. Four, five, red wine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>